Hi everyone. Each week we gather around God's Word in order to dig in deeply to what it teaches us. It is a privilege that I enjoy and I'm thankful that I have this opportunity. I trust that God uses it. Uh, the next couple of weeks I will possibly not, I won't be doing a video these next couple of weeks. Uh, I, I'm uh, going to be um, helping my wife. She's having some surgery. And um, I, I'll see what Pastor Andy is going to do as far as that's concerned. Um, and um, I'm just thankful for the opportunity this week. And then I look forward to a couple weeks down the road when I get to come back and record again. So uh, let me pray as we start. We're continuing in Genesis. We're, today we're in chapter 45. And we're looking at um, when Joseph not only revealed himself to his brothers, but then he invited his brothers to go and get their father to come to Egypt and to live there. And that's such, such an interesting situation, an interesting set of circumstances. And we'll look at all the background scripturally, we'll look at this passage, and we'll see how it brings uh, truth to our lives that needs to be applied. So that's where we go. So pray with me if you would. Our gracious and glorious Heavenly Father, we know that you have a plan and a purpose that is firmly in place. Uh, it's amazing to me that you, an almighty, all-powerful, sovereign God, uh, that you have that firm plan in place, and yet you allow us to have the freedom to do things that we desire to do. We're not robots. We're not programmed as... Uh, a computer would be, but rather, Father, we, uh, we have freedom. And in our freedom, I pray that we would never use it to, uh, to bring about bad results. Help us always to keep in mind that we're here to glorify you and to bring you honor. Help us to uh, see the truths that are most relevant to our lives on a consistent basis as we study your word, like here in Genesis, help us to see these truths. But Father, help us in our daily devotions. Help us in our regular prayer times. Help us in our communication with other followers of Christ and possibly with people that have not trusted in Christ as we try to present the wondrous uh, gospel that Jesus Christ came and died in place of sinners in order to take the penalty, to take the punishment, and to uh, alleviate that, to remove that, that, po that, that penalty that people have to face as they trust in him, as they believe in him. So help in that, Father. Uh, guide me as I try to communicate today the truths that are in this, this passage of Scripture. And again, thank you for loving us, Father. Thanks for caring for us the way that you do. We praise you for Jesus Christ. Our Lord, our Savior, the one that, that paid the price, and we, we bring this in his name. And all God's people said, Amen. All right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm told, and, and I, I have some evidence that this is true from uh, some of the historical documents that I've seen regarding uh, Dallas Seminary. That's where I went to school, and, and I don't give this illustration because I went to school there. I give this illustration because it, it's a very powerful uh, understanding of, of the way that God has worked in, in ways in the past. Uh, shortly after they were founded in 1924, uh, they actually had some financial issues, and they were on the brink of bank bankruptcy. The creditors were going to foreclose at noon on a specific day. And in light of that, that morning, the founders of the school met in the president's office to pray that God would provide in some special manner. They didn't know how that was going to happen. They realized that they were facing judgment, so to speak, from the financial officers. And... Um, that morning, as they met, they prayed that God would provide. And one of the men present at the meeting was the well-known Bible teacher, Harry Ironside. He tells the story, in fact. When it was his turn to pray, he prayed, Lord, we know that, that the cattle on a thousand hills are yours. Please sell some of them and send us the money. While they were praying, a Texas rancher stepped in into the business office and said that he had just sold carloads of cattle in Fort Worth. 
He said, I've been trying to make a business deal go through and it won't work. I feel that God is compelling me. He's telling me now to give the money to the seminary. I don't know if you need it or not, but here's the check. The secretary knew how critical the need was, so she took the check and knocked on the door of the president's office. Dr. Chafer took the check and saw that it was for the exact amount of the debt. When he looked at the signature on the check, he recognized the name of a Fort Worth cattleman. Turning to Dr. Ironside, he said, Harry, God just sold the cattle. And they provided for the need. Now, God provides for our needs, right? Yes, he does. Now, some people say he hasn't provided for all my needs, and maybe it's because we have wants or desires that aren't in line with God's need, with our needs and God's will. And we have to realize that, but God provided, he promised he will provide for us. Does he give us every whim, every wish that we have? No, he doesn't. But in this, in, in our culture today, God has provided for us in many, many wonderful uh, ways. And I think it's vital that we understand that truth. And we're seeing that in the passage we're studying today in Genesis 45, verse 16, through chapter 46, verse 7. And I just realized I'm going to have to stop the camera a minute. I left my Bible or I can't reach it. So I'm going to have to stop for a moment. So forgive me. It's going to be like a break in this. I'll have to tell Frank about that and as he edits the, 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 the video. So I'm going to pause the video right now. Hello once again. I realize there wasn't much of a pause for you, but there was a pause for me as I had to stop and grab my Bible. We're in Genesis 45 and 46, and I want to read this passage of Scripture that we're looking at today, that we're considering today. It's, it's a powerful passage in, in a very specific way because it shows that God provides for us physically, He provides for us emotionally, and most importantly, He provides for us spiritually. And as we see this passage, we see where it talks about Joseph, uh, Joseph uh, introducing himself to his brothers. They knew him, but they didn't know it was him. And we see that, and, and he's, he, is, he, he, he cleared the room. In fact, I'll explain this here in a few moments. I'm going to go back and look at some of the, the, the details that are uh, prior to what we're reading. But we, we dig in at, at chapter 45, and we're going to look at, at, at verses 16 and following, where it says, Now when the news was heard in Pharaoh's house that Joseph's brothers had come, it pleased Pharaoh and his servants. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Say to your brothers, do this, load your beasts and go to the land of Canaan and take your father and your households and come to me and I will give you the best of the land of Egypt and you will eat of the fat of the land. Now you are ordered, do this, take wagons from the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives and bring your father and come. Do not concern yourselves with your goods, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. Then the sons of Israel did so, and Joseph gave them wagons according to the command of Pharaoh and gave them provisions for their journey. To each of them he gave changes of garments, yet to Benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of garments. To his father he sent as follows, ten donkeys loaded with the best things of Egypt, ten female donkeys loaded with grain and bread and sustenance for his father on their journey. So he sent his brothers away, <clears throat> and as they departed, he said to them, Don't quarrel on the journey. Then they went up from Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to their father Jacob. He told them, saying, Joseph is still alive. And indeed, he is ruler, he is prime minister over all of Egypt. But J Jacob, he was stunned, and he could not believe what he heard. When they told him all the words of Joseph that he had spoken to them, and when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of their father, Jacob, revived. He was rejuvenated. His discouragement was lifted. And then Israel said, It is enough. My son Joseph is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. Chapter 46, verse 1. So Israel set out 
with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. God spoke to Israel in visions in the night and said, Jacob, Jacob, and Jacob said, here I am. Then he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. God's promise to Abraham, now God's promise to Jacob. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will surely bring you up again, and Joseph will close your eyes. Then Jacob arose from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried their father Jacob and their little ones and their wives in the wagons which Pharaoh had sent to carry them. They took their livestock and their property, which they had acquired in the land of Canaan, and came to Egypt. Jacob and all his descendants were with him, his sons and his grandsons with him, his daughters and granddaughters, and all his descendants he brought with him to Egypt. That's the passage. That's what we're seeing today. And I want us to understand that there is a background behind this that we, we need to recognize. Now, what's the summary? Everything in this portion of the narrative describing Jacob's family has a positive twist. We've had some challenging things we've read previous to this, but this is very positive. And Jacob, his discouragement is lifted, and he finds himself rejuvenated. And in fact, we, we know from Scripture, he lived 17 more years after he moved to Egypt. But we read here as well that that uh, Joseph was, ha, has determined that his brothers and attitudes and actions have changed. He's determined. They're different. There's, there's repentance and there was reconciliation. They have been reunited with one another. Pharaoh offered to bring Joseph's family to Egypt and provide for them during the rest of the famine. Joseph's family, or I mean Jacob's family, was revived by the reality that Joseph, or Jacob, I said family, Jacob's faith was revived by the reality that Joseph was alive and was doing very well. Yes, he was, he was a leader in Egypt. He was second in command. So with this, Joseph's childhood dreams were being fulfilled even more. Jacob's family would now live together in Egypt under the leadership of Joseph. The lessons included in this are an extraordinary example to us of how God's plans and purposes work together for the good of his people. If God is for us, who's against us? And I think it's important we get that planted in our minds as a truth that God wants us to understand. Now, here are some biblical truths that will provide a bit of context for us, some perspective, some proper perspective. God promised that Abraham's family would become a great nation. Genesis chapter 12. He came to Abram. He says, I will make from you a great nation. I will bless those that bless you. I will curse those that curse you. And he basically says, from you, Abraham, will come someone who will bless the entire world. He's pointing to the Messiah there. Now, God prophesied that Abram's family would live in a foreign land. Genesis chapter 15. He's reaffirming the covenant with Jacob, with, with Abraham. And he's basically saying to Abraham, I want you to understand that your descendants are someday going to live in a, in a strange land and they will live there for 400 years and they will eventually become slaves. Now, God predicted that. He prophesied that. And this is what's going on right here with Joseph and Jacob and all that we've been reading in Genesis. Now, Jacob's family, they'd actually become too comfortable with the Canaanites. That wasn't a good thing. So God knew that he had to move them into a place where they would be isolated and where that family would become a great nation. And that's why they went to Egypt. Jacob's words when he sent his sons with Benjamin to Egypt. This is what Jacob was not wanting to do. He says, take your brother also and arise, return to the man and may God Almighty grant you your other, grant you compassion in the sight of the man so that he will release you and your other brother and Benjamin. As for me, if I am bereaved of my children, then I'm bereaved. I'm grieved, he's basically saying. And what's that indicating? Jacob had become bitter towards everyone, even God. Jacob's faith was being uh, challenged. 
Now, Joseph's brothers showed evidence of repentance when they got to the land, got back to the land for the second time. Benjamin wasn't with them the first time. He was with them this time. And they showed changed hearts. And what we need to understand is re repentance requires, or re repentance makes reconciliation possible. Repent repentance makes reconciliation possible. Without repentance, there cannot be genuine reconciliation. Now, Joseph revealed his true identity to his brothers. He'd seen that they changed and requested them to go to Canaan and bring their father to Egypt. His brothers were speechless. And it's interesting to note that in Genesis 45, verses 1 through 13, every word that's spoken there is Joseph speaking to his brothers who couldn't speak. They, they, it's not that they were, were uh, unable to, to speak as, as, as people, but they were so stunned by the fact, this is our brother, our brother that we sold into slavery. Now, once his brothers knew that Joseph loved and forgave them, it says they reconciled with each other, they, they wept, they were embracing each other. Once they understood that he loved and forgave them, then they spoke. And it says they had a conversation. Now, when they had earlier in, in, in life, when, when they were together, they, they didn't get along. Joseph didn't get along with the brothers. Now, even though Joseph spoke to his brothers with deep emotion, with grace, with forgiveness, hope, and encouragement, he didn't ignore their sin. He saw that they had recognized the depth of their sin, and he noted that God had sent him to Egypt to save lives from the famine. He said that to his brothers, God sent me here. So the final point we're going to look at here before we dig into the, the, this text that we're studying today, meanwhile, Jacob was back in Canaan, anxiously waiting to see his other son and Benjamin. Notice he didn't name Simeon. That was his other son that was in captivity there because Joseph had put him in captivity. And Benjamin, who Jacob didn't want to send, he was anxiously waiting to see, will they return, return home safely? So that's the, the, the text. That's the passage that we're studying, or that's the background to it. Now, I have three basic points here that I want to express and explain, and then we're going to look at some applications that are very important. The first point is that God demonstrated his power and presence by prompting Pharaoh to provide for Joseph's family so they could move to Egypt. God demonstrated his power and his presence in that whole situation. I mean, they're in a pagan land, a land of heathens, and is God at work there, they may wonder? The brothers had, had noted when they were there the first time that there was this twinge of guilt. They said, what's God doing? Now here in this particular instance, in chapter 45, verses 16 through 20, we read that earlier, God demonstrated his power. He demonstrated his presence there in Egypt by prompting Pharaoh to provide for Joseph's family to move to Egypt. Pharaoh did this. Now, the Egyptians didn't like the Israelites. They didn't, they didn't have a, a, a respect or a, a desire to do anything with the Hebrews. Now, it's interesting, the Hebrew slave Joseph, he was so faithful, he was so conscientious that basically they noted, hey, this guy's different. But yet, they didn't see him as a Hebrew anymore. They saw him as an Egyptian because he was one of them. Now, Joseph understood that God had sent them, sent him. He sent, God sent the brothers there too. But God had sent Joseph to preserve and protect Egypt from the famine. That was Joseph's role and responsibility. And Pharaoh respected Joseph because Joseph had been so faithful to his God. He'd been faithful in his work. He was different than any others of those that worked for him and worked with him. And Pharaoh had a great respect for Joseph. Pharaoh trusted Joseph because Joseph proved to be trustworthy. What's that tell us? People will trust us when we prove to be trustworthy. Now, in this world today, that doesn't always work exactly the way we expect it to. But when God's working through that, yes, people will trust us when we, when we prove to be trustworthy. Now, Pharaoh promised 
promised Jacob, Joseph's family, he promised them the best of all the land of Egypt. Now that's interesting. Again, Pharaoh was promising these Hebrews to give them the best. Why? All because of Joseph. And Joseph had won Pharaoh's heart. Now, I think it's important for us to see, too, that it's very likely that Pharaoh and Joseph had discussed previously the idea of bringing his family to Egypt. I'm not sure when. I'm not sure how. I don't know that that happened, but I believe it's possible. But it's also possible that God was working in Pharaoh's heart in a way that we can't explain. But Pharaoh, by grace, by the grace that he offered, uh... He offered more to Joseph, or more to Joseph's family than what Joseph had promised. Joseph said, "Hey, bring Dad here." And when he, when he, but now Pharaoh offered more. He said, "I'll give you the best of Egypt." So what is that showing us? That's showing this. It's God's power. It's God's presence. It's God's prompting a heathen ruler. Maybe Pharaoh had come to follow the God of, of J- Joseph. I don't know that. Pharaoh was very, he was, he trusted Joseph and obviously he saw that Joseph trusted in his God and he offered more to Jacob's family than what Joseph was promising the brothers when he said, hey, go, go, go and get dad. And what does this show? God is a providing God. God provides for our needs. And we're going to explain that here in a little while. Now, secondly, in verses 21 through 24 of chapter 45, Joseph gave presents. He gave presents to his entire family. But also, he showed partiality to Benjamin. And it's interesting. Joseph, he, 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 didn't, um, he didn't even balk at the idea of showing Benjamin more favor than the rest of the brothers. And, and it's interesting to note that this didn't seem to provoke them to jealousy or anger. The brothers were not provoked by this. Joseph saw that they had changed. And then as he's sending them off, he gave them parting instructions. Before they left, he said, hey guys, don't argue, don't quarrel. He asked them to maintain peace on their journey with one another. Now, once again, as we look at this particular section, clothing, we saw earlier, clothing was a theme in in, in Joseph's narrative. And what went on with Joseph, his fancy coat that his dad had given him, his clothing that was ripped from him, his clothing that he was wearing when he went into work at Potiphar's house, and then as he, he's, he's being uh, seduced by, by Potiphar's wife, what happens? Joseph's clothing is left in her hands, and then he's accused of doing things he shouldn't have done. He didn't do it. He was innocent, but clothing was a theme. And then when Joseph is promoted, he's given, rather than prison garments, he's given the garments of a ruler. And and we see this. Now, here in this instance, Joseph is giving his brothers clothing. Now, when they saw that Benjamin had the the silver cup in in his bag, it says they were so despairing, they were so troubled by it, they ripped their clothing. And maybe that's why Joseph had to give them some clothing for their journey home, but yet he gave them brand new fancy clothes. And isn't it interesting, they had taken clothing from him, they had hated him because of his clothing, and now Joseph's giving them clothing. Isn't it interesting how this stuff, it comes back. And then Joseph, he gave money, he, he gave 300 pieces of silver to Benjamin. What had the brothers done? They had sold Joseph for 20 pieces of silver. They had sold Joseph for 20 pieces of silver, and yet here's Joseph giving silver to his brother and gave presents to all of them. He showed some partiality, and the brothers, did, they, didn't, they weren't provoked to anger. And we see that as all part of what's going on here. And then finally, the last thing I want us to see is when the brothers arrived home, they traveled home, a journey that probably would have taken, oh, maybe up to two weeks or more. I'm not sure. It was, it was close to 500 miles, if I'm not mistaken. 
They got home, they told their father that Joseph was the prime minister of Egypt. He wasn't the one top in charge, but he was second in command to Pharaoh. He's the prime minister of Egypt. But Jacob was so puzzled, he was so puzzled by this. How can that be? I thought Joseph was dead. And he didn't think it was possible. He didn't think this was possible. But when he saw all that was sent for him, the wagons, the attendants that were sent for him to carry him to Egypt, his perspective became positive. Rather than discouraged and negative, his perspective became positive. And God then, as they prepare to go to Egypt, he says they, it says he stopped in Beersheba, and there Jacob had a vision from God where he was promised God's presence as he went to Egypt. And Jacob, he had a different perspective, a different positive attitude. So as we see all of this, there are certain truths that I think we need to take for, to heart for this. And, 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 and I've got three of them, and uh, I'm going to try to explain as best I can. And actually, I have a fourth one that I want to just start off and say. In all of this, we see God's provision. God provided for Joseph all through his time in Egypt. He provided for him, and he had a plan. God provided for Jacob and the family throughout the famine. They had to go to Egypt to get it, and that was all part of God's plan, of course. And as God provided for what Pharaoh gave, and as he's coming to Egypt, let's realize that God is glorified when we gratefully use what he has graciously provided for us. And when it comes to the whole issue of our salvation, God is glorified when we are grateful for the fact that his grace saves us. God is glorified by that. And I think it's key that we understand that. But now, three applications that I have here that are in the notes. First off, there's a foundational truth illustrated in this lesson that we all need to believe and take to heart. It's a foundational truth. It's something that is true, and, and, and it, it, it's, it's foundational. It is part of our relationship with God to some extent. When we trust in Him as, as Jesus is our Lord and Savior, God comes and lives in our lives, and He begins a work in us. Philippians 1.6, Paul says, I know that, that He who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. And it's important for us to understand, it's vital for us to realize that God is constantly at work in the lives of those who faithfully follow and trust Him. He's working in our lives. We may face situations and say, hey, I, I don't like doing what God wants me to do here because it's, it's difficult. Or I don't know how I can address this situation because I, I need wisdom. But let's realize God is at work. He is shaping us to become more and more like Christ. He's providing for our emotional needs. He's providing for our physical needs. He's providing for our spiritual needs. And I think it's, it's our responsibility to understand that as we trust and obey and cooperate with Him, He is setting us apart in lives of holiness. He wants us to live holy lives. And His grace is sufficient to carry us through everything we'll face. God provides for us in a gracious manner. Do we earn this? Do we deserve this? No. But we trust Him. We believe in Him. We follow His guidelines and follow His, His, uh, His instructions. And He works in us to develop us into Christ-like individuals that can be witness to the world around us. That's a foundational truth. And I cannot be a witness for Christ unless I'm allowing God to work in me and change me and mold me and make me into what he wants me to be. But now secondly, there's a functional truth that is at the heart of this lesson that requires us to trust in God's authority and to recognize his timing is always perfect. It's a functional truth. And what we need to see is that God has promised to provide for our needs. That's a functional truth. But as we 
make that functional, let's realize God doesn't provide for every whim and wish that we have. He provides for the things that are necessary. And at times, we may face the challenge of saying, you know, I, I, I'm in need today. And I need to sort through and ask, what is necessary and what is just something that is a desire on my heart? And it says in Psalm 37 that, that God gives us the desires of our hearts when we trust him, when we walk according to his plans. But now Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, verse 13 and verse 19, it, it helps us understand these truths. And I want to turn there. And, 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 and get this uh, for us to see today. Uh, Philippians, when I say see, I'm going to read it for us. There it is. Philippians 4. Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord, rejoice always. He basically says that's one of the key areas of our relationship is we rejoice that God is working in us and through us and with us. Philippians 1.6. He who began a good work in us, he'll consistently work until the day of Christ Jesus, until the day of our death, till the day of the rapture. He will work in us. And as we see what he says here, he says, Rejoice and learn always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentle, your forbearing spirit be known to those around you. The Lord is near. But we see next, don't be anxious. Don't be uptight about things. Don't have a double-mindedness. Rather, keep your focus on the Lord. Be anxious for no good reason. Or be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, it's beyond our understanding. It will guard our hearts. It will protect our hearts in Christ Jesus. Our hearts and our minds. It protects our minds, too. We see in verse, uh, verse 13, he says, Paul starts off in verse 12, he says, I know how to get along in every situation. Why? Because he is applying these truths to his life. And he says, I can do all things through him, through Christ who strengthens me. And we are indebted to Jesus Christ. We are enabled by Jesus Christ. And John 15, 5, without Christ, we can do nothing. So we see that. And then finally, uh, verse 19, uh, he says, um, And my God, Paul is talking there to followers of Christ, He, my God, will supply all your needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. According to His riches. And those riches, what are, what are they? They are the spiritual riches that, that help us to become more and more like Christ. So that's a functional truth. God has promised to provide for our needs. Not for every whim and wish, but His timing is perfect. He's never early, and He's also never late. His purposes and plans are His purposes and plans. And then finally, the last one. There's a focus truth that's here. It's at the heart of this lesson that we all need to recognize and we need to submit to God's authority. It's, it's a focused truth. If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, what's it mean that God is for us? We see in Romans 8, verse 1. I could read the whole chapter and it would be a wonderful, wonderful lesson for us to, to, to see today. But I just want to read the, 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 the specific verses here. Romans 8, 1, there is therefore no, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Once I've trusted Christ and I'm fully following Jesus Christ as my Lord, as my Savior, I don't have to be worried, I don't have to worry about being condemned because of the sins that I've committed. My sins are cleansed. My sins are washed away. Jesus Christ paid the price. God is for us. He, he, he's not against us. But then we see in verse 28, wonderful passage of Scripture. I, I like translating this a little bit differently than what we see in, 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 in the Scripture here in front of me. Here it says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good for to, to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. 
I like to see the Greek language here, and I like to translate it that we know that God orchestrates all things in such a fashion that they work together for what's best for us. And those are who are us. Those are, those are the people that love God by trusting and obeying, and they are called to follow God's plans and purposes. We follow God. We don't follow man. And we see that as being very, very vital. We see that as important. But then finally, we see in verses 31 through the end of the chapter, we see, what then can we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, delivered him to take our place, how will he not also with him freely give to us all things, the things that we need, not the things we want necessarily, the things we need. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one that justifies, and we are justified through faith in Jesus Christ. So we see, who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised and who is at the right hand of God, who intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, will distress, will persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are, we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in these things, in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Through Christ we conquer. Through Christ we are strengthened. And it says, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And as we see this, we realize that um, if, God, if God is for us, who can be against us? We have victory on our side. When we consider all that he's done for us to graciously provide for our salvation, why would we ever think that God is against us? The world is what opposes us. The world is a challenge. And they are constantly trying to confuse us, to uh, basically uh, get us to the point where we're, we're questioning things. And the battle we face is spiritual. We must always keep in mind that God is working for what's best for those of us who love him and we're called according to his plans and purposes. And let's understand that God is for us. We live in a world where there's a lot of challenges, there's a lot of difficulties. And how do I get over those difficulties? How do I get past that? I recognize that it's through Jesus Christ, my Lord, my Savior. It's through Christ. And if, if, if God is for us, nothing can be against us. So let's hang on in faith, in perseverance, and endurance, realizing that God is working in us to develop us into all that he wants us to be. That's great. And let's pray. Father, I thank you again for your care, for your love that just literally transforms our lives. I, I praise you for that. I praise you that you are at work in us. Sometimes you're chiseling and having to sand us in such a fashion that it, it hurts a little bit. Sometimes you're working in us and it's just building us up in such a positive way. We say, oh, wow, that feels good. But Father, work in us and make us more and more like Jesus. Help us to deal with the challenges we face in a biblical, spirit-led fa fashion. And I pray, Father, that we will understand that you provide for us. You provide what's best for us. You provide for us in a very personal and positive way. And when we sometimes go astray or sometimes go in a direction we shouldn't go, Father, we need to turn back to you and say, help us, guide us, lead us. We need to repent of those areas of sin in our lives that sometimes grab hold of us and, and cause us to, uh, uh, to do things we shouldn't. But Father, help us to be strong in you and in the power of your might. I pray your blessing over all of us who are following you, for all of us that are seeking to be a testimony and a witness to this world. This world needs witness, Father. Help us in that role. Help us in that responsibility. And thank you again, Father. We love you. We praise you. And we ask all these things in the wondrous, powerful name of Jesus. And everyone says...
Yes. Amen. Hey, thanks for being being part, part of this. Thanks for watching, for listening. And, and uh, again, I appreciate it when, when, when people contact me and let me know some of the things that uh, maybe, maybe you want to say something that, that um, you know, you want to ask me something. Maybe you want to say, hey, I, I wish you'd make that clearer or something like that. I, I appreciate it when people contact me. And uh, God's in charge. And uh, we'll uh, look forward to seeing you again in, 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 in the future.